Dave LaBelle was worried I was going to give his talk there for a second. Um, so I want to talk about uh, natural gas this afternoon and uh, follow a number of the remarks that uh, Roland introduced. And um, as you all know, the, the big story in natural gas is producing natural gas from shale. The areas shown in red are the places uh, in North America where uh, shale gas is being uh, exploited. The shale oil or tight oil, Roland referred to, are shown in green. Um, at the bottom, it says that we have about 2,300 TCF of gas. Uh, that number doesn't mean much, except it's about 100 years at current consumption rates. That's a lot of gas. In the press, you read about these numbers being argued, it's claimed sometimes they're overstated. Um, I actually think they're understated. There's a lot of gas um, out there. And to exploit that gas, it's going to take tens of thousands of wells uh, per year. We're now drilling about 20,000 wells, mostly for oil, but that's kind of the level of activity. So to exploit that gas, hundreds of thousands of wells will be drilled and millions of hydrofracks will be carried out. And we have to both optimize the development of that resource and, of course, minimize the environmental impact. And it's mostly the latter topic I'll address today. Now, this slide is about 15 years old from the Department of Energy and shows the benefit of different um, sources of energy for making electricity. And natural gas produces about half as much CO2. Of course, much less SOx and NOx, essentially no particulates, mercury, et cetera. So in theory, it's a much better fuel for making electricity. And in fact, as uh, Roland alluded, uh, the electricity produced uh, making elect uh, the CO2 produced making electricity has decreased dramatically 20% in just a few years. Now, if you look around the world, this is another presentation of the kind of data uh, he was introducing, and you actually add the current estimated resource of unconventional gas to that which we know about, the conventional gas, you get a truly astronomic number of about 170 years of natural gas. In fact, this number also is extremely small because in this study, which was commissioned by the uh, US DOE, uh, many parts of the world simply had no data available. Russia, many of the states in the former Soviet Union, um, parts of South America, and parts of Africa. So the numbers are, are, are truly enormous, even um, you know, in these areas which are, in which we're just starting um, development. And the, and the big player, as Roland said, is, is China. <clears throat> Now, with respect to unconventional gas resources, shale gas, they are producing essentially zero now, but their estimated resources are, are quite appreciable. In fact, the Chinese um, resource is on the order of that of North America. If you add US and Canada together, you get, get about you know, the, uh, p the potential for producing uh, shale gas from China. And why is this important? It's important because Chinese energy consumption is expected to double in about 25 years. And a business as usual scenario is that the amount of electricity they'll produce from coal is also going to double. Now, in the US, we're producing about 2 billion tons of CO2 per year by making electricity from coal. The Chinese are producing seven. So their current emissions are th for electricity. Their current emissions are three and a half times ours. And if that doubles, it goes to 14. So it really doesn't matter if we go from two to zero if the Chinese go from seven to 14. And that's, and that's where the battle is, is to help the Chinese as rapidly as possible to not exploit coal for their new energy needs, but instead to use natural gas as the transition fuel until their renewable portfolio is large enough to carry you know, the load and, and meet the needs. So the, 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 the opportunity and the issues in China dwarf those uh, essentially everywhere else. Let me just say a few words geologically uh, about what, what shale is and where this shale gas comes from. Um, basically, these are deep water deposits, and so the sediments in the rock are very fine grained, they're clays, and as the marine organisms, the phytoplankton and other organisms die, when they fall to the bottom, if they get buried in this clay fast enough, they won't oxidize. And when you bury and trap that carbon in place, over time, 
it will turn into a waxy substance called kerogen, and that kerogen over time will turn into either oil or gas. So these, these formations, these geologic formations we're talking about are the traditional source rocks of the oil and gas industry. We've always known they were there. What's new is our ability to produce hydrocarbons from them. Now this is an SEM photograph which shows, um, I'm trying to get the, well, I'll use it. This is a, this black le uh, lensoid thing, that's the kerogen. If you zoom in on it, you can begin to see some pits in the kerogen. And if you zoom in some more, you can actually see the pores through which the gas is flowing. This is the Eagleford Shale, which Roland mentioned. These are very large pores as they go. They're about 150 nanometers across. They're extremely small. And what this means is that these rocks have a permeability. The permeability is the ease with which fluid moves through the rock. A permeability that's a million times smaller than a conventional reservoir. So the reason we do horizontal drilling, the reason we do multi-stage hydraulic fracturing is to get the resource out of these extremely low permeability rocks, a resource we've always known was there. And this is done by first drilling a vertical well to sort of assess the, the, the depth and thickness of the shale, then drilling a horizontal well. They're, they tend to be about 5,000 feet long, longer in some places, shorter in others. We put various kinds of pieces of hardware into the well that allows us to hydraulically fracture the well starting at the toe and backing up toward the heel for so named for obvious reasons. Typically about 15 hydrofracs per well are being completed um, and these little dots represent tiny little micro earthquakes, little slip events on tiny little faults. The uh, magnitude is on the order of about minus two, a minus two earthquake is about the same amount of energy as a gallon of milk falling off a kitchen counter. Um, it's not very much, much energy. But this process is increasing the permeability enough to allow you to produce commercial quantities. But there's no question that horizontal drilling and multi-stage hydraulic fracturing is a large-scale industrial process. And large-scale industrial processes have the potential to produce uh, environmental damage in lots of different ways. And these issues are familiar to all of you. Uh, certainly you can have surface contamination due to spills. There's a tremendous impact on residents and land use and fragmentation of ecosystems by building roads and pipelines. Air pollution is an issue. There's a real concern about hydraulic fracturing affecting well water. Utilization of scarce water supplies came up. Methane leakage uh, from wells came up and earthquakes triggered not by the hydraulic fracturing process itself, but by the injection of what's called flowback water. After you hydrofrac, you pull the water out of there to get it out of the way so the gas can flow, but the water that comes back out of the shale has a number of contaminants which require it to be uh, handled appropriately and when it's injected, it has uh, been causing earthquakes uh, in, some, in some areas. But we know all of these problems by the word no fracking, no fracking. And it, it's really kind of ironic because essentially none of these problems have anything to do with hydraulic fracturing. And they are problems, but they also have solutions. And when we look at the problems, we can seek solutions. The question came up about water supplies. In general, hydraulic fracturing, if you're in Pennsylvania, um, the amount of water used for hydraulic fracturing increases the demand for uh, fresh water by a tenth of one percent, which is no big deal. Um, if you're in other areas where fresh water is in short supply, it is a big deal. However, you can also drill, you can also hydrofrac with saline water. It's done all the time. Every offshore platform, it, nobody's hauling fresh water out to the platform. They're drilling with saline water. They're fracking with saline water. So there are alternatives. When earthquake triggering is a problem and injection is a problem, you recycle the water. 95% of the water that is produced after hydraulic fracturing in Pennsylvania is reinjected in the next hydrofrac job. The problem goes away. So, you know, if, if, if we don't pay attention, these are really serious problems, but like a lot of problems associated with industrial processes, once we look at them, we can find workable solutions. 
Now, a couple years ago, a uh, Secretary of Energy committee uh, I served on uh, looked at these problems, and we looked at them from a variety of perspectives. Um, on the committee was the former chairman of the Petroleum Engineering Department from Texas A&M and the president of the Environmental Defense Fund. They did not exactly see the world the same. And, and yet, um, this diverse group of individuals were unanimous in their conclusion that shale gas could be developed in an environmentally responsible manner. But we pointed out about 20 areas where current practice needed to be significantly improved to reduce the problems of shale gas uh, appreciably and needed to be done. And we made those uh, recommendations and I'm not going to go through it except to talk about a couple of issues that um, I think most people are concerned about. One question is whether or not the vertical growth of the hydrofrac, you know, from the depth of the shales, um, will have the ability, in some cases, to grow up and potentially contaminate near surface water supplies. Now, this is not happening. It has not happened. It has never happened in North America. And the reason for that is that the depth of the shale is very large compared to the depth of the freshwater wells. So as you go from right to left across these diagrams, you see the depth of the Barnett Shale. It from ranges between about 5,000 feet and 8,000 feet. The blue represents the depth of water wells, uh, USGS uh, database. And the spiky signal shows the depth at which these little micro-earthquakes are occurring. And sometimes they occur about 1,000 feet above, above the shale. But they are still about 5,000 feet below the freshwater supplies. This, this is not a problem. What is a problem is well construction. And this slide was made by George King. George King works for one of the big independent oil and gas producers, uh, Apache Corporation. He claims to have done 2,000 hydrofrac jobs, and, and I believe him. And what he's doing here is he's using kind of a, a generalized geology of western Pennsylvania to point out that it, the API recommended practice is to put in surface casing and cement it thoroughly to 500 feet, which normally takes care of protecting the aquifers. But what George points out is that when there are coal layers present or um, shale layers that might produce a little bit of gas but would never be economically produced, what you really need to do is put in multiple strings of casing and multiple cement barriers so that if there's a problem with one of them, you have multiple barriers to in fact you know, you know, protect the water supplies. And so, to me, the issue is whether you're talking about contamination or you're talking about methane leakage, either in the near term or the long term, the issue is well construction, well construction, and well construction. It is really not um, hydraulic fracturing. Now, the impact on land is, 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 is enormous. And uh, this figure was uh, on the promotional brochure. And this is what Chesapeake likes to show is the, uh, the before and after. It is a transitory process, and it really makes a mess when you're drilling these wells. It can be largely reclaimed, but not thoroughly reclaimed. And one of the things we pointed out is that the sheer numbers of these wells really requires us to look at the development process differently. We're not just drilling a couple of wells. We're drilling a couple of hundred wells. And this needs to be looked at more holistically. There has to be, you know, the cumulative impact has to be assessed. We have to stand back and say, okay, if wells are going to be drilled in this area, how are they drilled? How do we take care of water supplies? How do we minimize the number of roads, pipelines, minimize the impact on residents, uh, fragmentation of ecosystems, and so on? Methane leakage came up. The best available study to date, and the last word has not been spoken on this topic, comes from uh, NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab in Boulder, and this uh, special institute they set up has looked at this. They've looked at 16,000 wells from the Barnett Shale, the place where it all began, and they conclude, looking at fresh data and with fresh eyes and I think an unbiased perspective, that unconventional natural gas is producing about half of the CO2 equivalent emissions, even, even taking in the methane, Okay, the, the greenhouse gas impact is basically the same as predicted originally, and, and it's about half of coal, and it's about the same as conventional um, natural gas. So we have to be careful, and if we mess up, we will in fact make the situation worse 
because methane is a far more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. A recent paper uh, by Alvarez and others pointed to the issue of, of leakage, not in the wells, but in the entire transportation and distribution system. And this is a problem that's been extant for a long period of time. And so the fact that there's extra scrutiny basically means that this is um, a problem. We're, we're correcting an old problem because we're worried about natural gas, but at least we're correcting a problem regardless of the motivation. And the thing they point out is this fuel switching from coal to natural gas has an immediate benefit on greenhouse gas emissions and its effect on climate. Transportation is a much more problematic issue. It's longer term, and it's really not clear what the, what the net gain is going to be. So to wind up, um, I want to just emphasize a few points, and, and that is that I, I'm convinced, and our committee was convinced, and I think people who've looked at this issue um, in detail are convinced that there's, there are no barriers to developing this resource in an environmentally responsible manner. No barriers from a technological perspective, but we still have to carry out these operations correctly. We have to regulate them, and we have to enforce the regulations. Uh, but we know how to do these things, and we just have to get at it. There are important issues. Um, you know, it's really frustrating to hear the oil and gas industry sort of say, well, you know, everything's just fine. Everything's not just fine. Um, everything's pretty good. It's not the end of the world either, but they could be a lot better. Hydraulic fracturing does not contaminate aquifers, but poorly constructed shale gas wells could, or they could even leak meth you know, methane into the atmosphere and obviate the benefit of fuel switching. And I, I do believe that natural gas, shale gas, is, the global shale gas uh, resource is in fact a blue bridge to a green future. Whether it's a cliche or not, I still believe it. It's an enabling mechanism to start the process of decarbonization. We know where we are, we know where we wanna go, and shale gas can help us get there. It's not the end game, but you know, it buys us 30, 40 years of greatly reduced emissions while we're building our renewable portfolio. And um, I think we have to take this long perspective when we start discussing this resource with respect to other energy options. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, It seems that the leakage of methane would be exacerbated by the greater length of the pipeline, right? More possibilities. So the pipeline that's supposed to come from Canada to Texas seems just like a potential disaster. Um, well, that'll be the subject of a, a breakout session, and that's an oil pipeline, not a gas pipeline. But you're right. Pipeline leakage, is, you know, gas leakage, is a problem and, uh, and needs to be looked at and needs to be uh, addressed. Quick question. It's been my experience that there are cultural factors involved here. If you've ever dealt with roofers, you know that culturally they're slobs. Uh, they'll rip things off your roof and they'll simply throw them off the side of the building. And dealing with cleaning up after roofers is a problem. The reason I bring this up is that historically, Petroleum drillers are slobs. And so what needs to be in place are firm and well-enforced regulations on their behavior because from what you say, and I believe you, technologically, the dangers can be handled. But culturally, they need to be addressed. And it is my memory that the initial legislation regarding this particular uh, exploration and, and production technology specifically made it easier by excluding the kinds of regulations we would need. Can you address that? Well, you, you made several points. Um, I think drilling is, a, is a, you know, a process that started pretty messy and has gotten cleaned up 
if by regulatory dictate or uh, you know, uh, whatever reason. It's, 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 it's not as bad as you think. In a lot of these places where the drilling is taking place, no fluid sometimes touches the ground. Everything goes into tanks. Um, it's gotten a lot better. Now, the, the exclusion you're talking about is probably one of the biggest mistakes the oil and gas industry has made in many decades, and they, they've made plenty. Um, and that was to get the chemical you know, that are used in the frac fluids excluded from disclosure under the Clean Water Act. Uh, what's being injected is really not very bad stuff, but everybody thinks it is. It's actually what's coming out of the well that's far more of concern. So they have a singular exclusion in that regard. They shouldn't. It has been counterproductive, okay? But it is a highly regulated industry. It's not regulated well enough, and I think some key issues are are not being addressed sufficiently. But it's not a bunch of slobs out there just messing up the environment. Um, I think that's not an appropriate characterization. It might have been at one time, but the industry has gotten a lot more sophisticated and a lot more concerned about uh, environmental issues. Uh, you know, they're environmentalists too. So I have a question about the role of insurance, perhaps, in this. Uh, the reason I ask is I'm from Western Pennsylvania. I actually worked for the U.S. Bureau of Mines for a while. Uh, and I remember the kinds of things uh, near Pittsburgh where houses would collapse because a 50-year-old uh, coal mine, you know, collapsed under it. So, so I guess the, one of the questions is regulation is good. Sometimes one would like a, a, some role for insurance so that if, you know, some water does get contaminated, you know, 10, 20 years from now that the people affected, um, you know, have an easier recourse in trying to do a lawsuit against somebody who isn't there anymore. Yeah, I, I personally, I agree very much. Traditionally, in the oil and gas industry, companies post what's called a, a, a P&A bond, plugging and abandoning, which says when they're all done, in order to get their bond back, they will properly seal the well. Um, these requirements are many, many decades old. There's so little money that's put up, there's no, you know, and the wells change hands many times. Um, so, in fact, the state of Texas has had to create a uh, statewide pool to make sure that as wells are abandoned, there's sufficient funds. And it's basically a state insurance policy because this, this old bonding uh, process simply didn't work. So we need new regulatory mechanisms, and, and getting the private sector involved is probably a very good thing to do. And put it, making it, uh, and, and getting the, the dollar amounts appropriate so the companies are motivated to do the right thing is important too. Okay, one more question right there. Of your 20 recommendations that the group made, how many were adopted either voluntarily or by the legislature? Um, not as many as I would have hoped. Um, the Department of Energy, who commissioned our, our study at the request of the president, has no regulatory authority. So we were making these regulations with the hope that other federal agencies, um, like BLM, when drilling is done on, on, on federal land, or the state agencies who regulate drilling on private land in their own states, would adopt more of our regulations. I mean, we said there should be full disclosure of the chemicals. There should be full manifesting of the water. All of that data should be on publicly accessible databases. Now, it turns out that about two-thirds of the wells are being uh, put up voluntarily into Frac Focus, which is a, an online database that keeps track of these. But it should be 100% of the wells. The data should be a, a, in accessible databases. That's not being done. A lot of things aren't being done. There's a lot of potential to do things better. And, uh, and we, you know, our 20 recommendations didn't cover everything. There's still more, uh, more that needs to be done. So, you know, you're, you're just out there and you try and you do your best and you hope somebody's listening and, and follows up. All right, thank you much.